I'm feeling low down and blue and my heart's full of sorrow. Welcome to this edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series. We spent some quality time with Kansas City jazz legend David Bassey. From the stage as a celebrated jazz singer to the airwaves as a dedicated jazz broadcaster, he is KC through and through. After 40 years as a performer, he took some time to go over his career, what is going on with his radio shows, how he's doing these days, and a plethora of tasty jazz tales that will keep you smiling. KC has always been lucky to have such a titan as Dave on the stage and behind the mic. Please dig this newest interview, my friends. David, thank you for taking a little time out to talk with me today. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure, Joe. So I'm going to go ahead and start off here and ask you, what has been going on with you lately? What has been going on with me lately? Well, I'm a very busy man. I have three different radio shows that I'm involved with, and most of that information or all that information can be found on my website, uh, davidbassey.com, or the Kansas Public Radio website, which is kpr.ku.edu. Um, I host a Saturday afternoon radio show on KPR, which I've done for uh, right around 15 years since the turn of the century. And um, 12th Street Jump, I'm a regular member of that particular troupe, and that's a syndicated show. It's like a Prairie Home Companion, but it's jazz-based. And then Jazz Alive Overnight is my latest syndicated show, and it's uh, an overnight jazz show that's, that airs on Kansas Public Radio in this particular part of the country. And uh, besides that, I, you know, play music and produce records. I have another record coming out soon and uh, book bands, help other bands. Um, and I, I have actually gone back to school, Joe, so I'm, I just stay busy. Burn the candle at every end. <laughs> that's exactly it, yeah. I like to be busy. Right on. So let me ask you about The Hero and the Lover. When, when was that released? Well, it was released in Kansas City in November, 1st of November of 2013. Okay. But then it went out to radio nationally in of 2014. So what has the reception been for this album? Well, it's been, it's been good. Um, okay. I sold the first thousand copies of the disc in Kansas City uh, in November and December of 2013. And I consider that a success in this kind of music, you know, in jazz music. Sometimes a, a national release will sell 1,500 or 2,000 copies these days because of downloads and because of the difference in the way that music is presented these days. Right on. Yeah. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go to the alpha of your life. You're born and bred in KC. Give me some of your best memories here. Some of my best memories here? Yeah, yeah, when you were growing up, some real, you know, some of your fondest memories. Well, I I uh, was born in San Jose, California, and I was raised in Nebraska. So okay. the, uh, my parents moved to Nebraska, moved back to Nebraska when I was four. Okay. Both of my mom and my pop were from uh, Nebraska, and so I went to grade school in Norfolk, Nebraska, and I went to high school in Columbus, Nebraska. Okay. And then I came to Kansas City when I was 19, and uh, I had been on the road two years then. So I, I became a professional musician when I was 14. Okay. I graduated from high school when I was 17, and then I spent the 17, 18, and the 19 out on the road. And then uh, some musicians I met on the road told me I needed to come here. Mm-hmm. Um, the The reason being, I really had a strong uh, drawing to the blues and I really didn't know that you know because I had grown up in the the country and so we really only knew what we heard on the radio so like many people my age I live K-A-N-Y in Little Rock, Arkansas uh, when I was young Beaker Beaker Street they called it and that came on at 11 at night from Little Rock, and it was a very interesting all-night radio show that had a combination of the music of the day, which was the late 60s, so long cuts, uh, the Grateful Dead, the, the Jimi Hendrix, uh, things like that, and then they would slip in some poetry and maybe some jazz and maybe some blues, and so I really learned a lot from that, and then when I came to Kansas City, I met Joe Cartwright, the pianist, 
Yeah. Two of us started hitting places like the Foundation, the Musicians Foundation, and and we met. You know, I met. Uh, we met people like Everett Devan and uh, Mama Ray and the Scamps and a lot of the mainstays of the scene here. And they were filming that movie, The Last of the Blue Devils, at the time. And so I just became immersed in the in the scene of Kansas City. Right on. So your music idols growing up that mentioned was Hendrix, The Doors, Cream, and The Beatles. How did you land in the jazz realm with that kind of as your 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 music idols? Well, it's fairly easy, you know, because the Cream, of course, uh, so at least two of the musicians in that band were were really jazz musicians. Jack Bruce was always a jazz lover, and, and uh, most of his bands kind of lent themselves to be improvisational or, uh, you know, jazz or blues bass. Ginger Baker has a jazz album out this year. And yeah. Of course, Eric Clapton, one of the great improvisers of all time. And that band, you know, the interesting thing about the about Cream is Cream recorded all five of their albums within nine months. Mm-hmm. The band really only lasted for nine months. Yeah. And then went on to you know, all the other stuff that they did in life. And it clapped and of course, the, the most visible. But, you know, Jimi Hendrix, too, one of the great improvisers. And so I, I just really... Uh, I didn't really get the correlation. You know, it was a, it was a guitarist here in town uh, 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 named uh, Danny Hensley. And, and I was playing with Danny, and he said, you really like the blues, don't you? And I said, you know, I really don't know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he said, well, what rock and roll do you listen to? And I told him, you know, John, I like John Lennon more than I like Paul McCartney, and I like the Stones, and I like Cream. And he says, you know, that's all the blues. All that music comes from Willie Dixon, you know, John Lee Hooker, Muddy Water. And I was like, oh, really? So you gotta get, you got to get hip. you got to learn all this stuff. you got to go back and listen to the originals of these songs. So that became a, a quest. You know, it became a lifelong quest, actually, which yeah. led me to Miles Davis and Charlie Parker and you know, all the other stuff in music and jazz and so Right on. So how old were you when you saw Jay McShann and Claude Fiddler at the Kansas State Fair and decided that jazz was your calling? Well, I was playing, this this would have been after Joe and I went back out on the road, so it would have been probably 70, probably 75 or 6. And they were playing, uh, Jay and Claude and Paul Gunther were playing in a, in a little nightclub in, in Hutchinson, not actually at the fair, but in Hutchinson. And yeah. uh, we were playing in a country western bar. Uh, the place I remember the place they were playing was like on a, on a little lake, like a sand pit kind of lake in Hutchinson. And mm-hmm. we were like at a downtown, you know, just a funky little bar kind of place where we played music, you know. <laughs> And we we play you know but like in those days you could, you played at a place you know four five six nights when you when you played so you would go in and play Monday through Saturday or Wednesday through Saturday or something like that so after we were finished uh, Cartwright and I went over to see them play and I must have been twenty one twenty twenty one something like that both of us were and you know the thing that impressed me the most was that even though it was just a funky little joint with the you know half a house on a Wednesday night or whatever they were all in suits and ties and white shirts and we were all dressed to kill you know mm-hmm. at that time Claude was playing mostly the double neck guitar so he played the bass on one neck and he played the guitar on the other neck mm-hmm. there was a ballad that he could be featured on or something like that, or he would, he would play he would play the violin. So so he would play the bass while Jay was singing, and then Jay would take over the bass with the piano, and then he and then Claude would take the guitar solo on the other neck. Hmm. And, uh, it was odd. It was very odd. Yeah. <laughs> a great drummer, but it was swinging like crazy. You know, it was swinging like crazy, and uh, you know as time went on. Joe and I both had great interaction with, with Jay and Claude and 
Paul Gunther and Laverne Barker, who was another part of that group of folks, and uh, Eddie Lockjaw Davis was a part of that group of folks. And, you know, it was like there was just this, just this great depth. Uh, yeah. You know, in this kind of music, I mean, you can have a huge success one day and then you can be playing a little little corner bar the next, you know. Yeah. That's kind of how it works in jazz and, and blues and related music. Uh, it's it's something you do because you love it. It's not something you do to be a rock star or be, you know, famous or whatever. It's it's more just about getting getting the job done and being, and being in it, you know. That's, yeah. that's the blessing of it. That's, that's winning, is just being in it and doing it, you know. Absolutely. So speaking of live gigs, do you remember your first real, like, serious live jazz gig, how you felt, where you were at, and how you approached the gig? Um, you know, I think my first serious gig of that sort was really with a, a, a sort of a pseudo-country band. Western Swing, I guess we kind of focused on, and it was uh, Cartwright and I and uh, uh, John Blessy, who who uh, went on to play with the guy named Soji, the guy that plays down in Branson, the violinist, the Japanese violinist. Oh yeah. He played the, John played the guitar and sang, and we had a bassist named Elmo Batman, and Batman came from uh, Great Bend, Kansas, and the four of us. Uh, we also had various singers that sang with us. Gene Sloan was one, and, and, a, and a, another uh, another guy that sang with us named uh, 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 I can't think of his first name. His last name was Brown. And but but the four of us became the nucleus of a band at at a nightclub, and we played for three years in this nightclub, six nights a week, five and a half hours a night, six nights a week, five and a half hours a night, which is like. Unbelievable, you know, to play that much music, 33 hours a week. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so we would play, we, we would play games with one another while we were, we play musical games while we were playing, you know, because each of us sang in this band uh, and each of us had different musical interests. We would just, we would pass it around. It would be like, I would pick a song and then, John would pick a song, and then Joe would pick a song, and then Batman would pick a song, and then, you know, like that. So that's yeah. that's basically the definition of a hoot nanny. Is like you sit around and or, or you or you just play, and each person picks a song, you know, and you just keep you just keep doing that. Yeah, and there's a very good communication that goes on in that. So like John, you know, could sing easily sing 500 plus songs off the top of his head, so he could do all the all the uh, John Prine songs, and he could sing, you know, deep into the Johnny Cash songbook and songs from the 50s, you know. But just, <laughs> he was like the ultimate winner of all the contests because he could sing like 25 John Prine songs, you know, <laughs> Dylan songs, you know, all kind of stuff. So so the, he was almost like a secret weapon, you know, uh, yeah. you know for that Thing because we were trying, what we were doing at that point is we were trying to play as many things as we could, and Joe and I were having jam sessions with real books, if you know what a real book is. We were calling people together, and then we were playing stuff out of the real book and learning tunes, you know, learning learning jazz tunes. And so uh, it was, a, that, but my first gig was like with this band called the Cowtown Rangers, and it, it was at the at Parody Hall when it was on 39th Street, and it was a big deal for us. And Chuck Haddix, who's now the the, the voice of the Fish Fry on KCUR and uh, the the director of the Mars Sound Archives, he wrote a piece in the Pitch magazine about us that we were cool and that people should come and see us. So it was our first, you know, it was really our first real gig as a like, okay, we we selling tickets. We, we're, we got written up with the paper and we're presenting a kind of music that's kind of popular and new, you know, because uh, Western Swing was kind of having a little resurgence in the late 70s when this happened. Yeah, so with all the years of wisdom behind you, when you think about that first gig and the way you get on stage and approach a gig today, what's the big difference between then and now? 
So there's really no difference. Um, you know, no matter what you, no matter what I do in music, no matter how grandiose an event will be, I always get nervous. I always get a little, you know, get the little butterfly kind of thing going on. And you almost wonder, I mean, if you don't give it that deep thought, you know, I don't think you're really trying, you know. I mean, you give it that deep thought of like, wow, can I really do this, you know. Am I going to remember everything? Am I, am I going to sound good? Am I going to sing on key? Am I going to play well, you know. I mean, you're, you you get a little bit nervous all the time. So there's really no difference. I mean, it's not to me anyway. It's always just as fresh as the day it was when I began. You know? Right on. Right on. So it's very, very evident that you have a passion for, for preserving Kansas City's jazz history. Why is that? There's something about it that really resonates with me. Sometimes, like I've felt in the past that maybe I, you know, maybe I'm reincarnated or something. Maybe I lived in that time. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a couple of pictures that I'll I'll joke and say that's me, you know, like this picture. There's a picture of a guy with a hat on when Aladdin was about nine, about eighteen or nineteen, and he was playing with Jay McShann, and there's a lot of people like that in the in the photo, iconic jazz pictures and I, I, the guy that you can't see his face, I said, well, that, that, that's me in, the, you know, 1932, <laughs> you, know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but I'm joking, of course, and there's a there's a picture of Monk and Bird playing together in a New York nightclub, and there's this guy sitting at the, at the table smoking a cigarette, and I said, that's me, and then people say, really? He said, you could not, nah, that could have been you, <laughs> but, I, you know, I have an affinity for it, I have a, I have a deep deep affinity for this kind of music. It it resonates with me. It is it is in my DNA. And you know, at this point after playing this kind of music for forty years, there's really not anything else I want to do that I want to play. I just I mean I want to explore more more music but but it always ends up sounding having that kind of sound in a way, you know. That kind of Yeah. Which is fine. I love it. Love it. Yeah. So, you know, speaking of Kansas City's jazz history, it really seems like Kansas City's going through its own level of jazz renaissance these days. A lot of people are coming out of UMKC from Bobby Watson's program, and it just seems like there's a lot going on. Do you feel like there's kind of a resurgent renaissance vibe going on in jazz in Kansas City? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, whenever I hear something like that, I think about the bumper sticker uh, that says, big bands are back. <laughs> and, and you always have to ask the question, where did they go? Yeah. You know, and why are they coming back? Because they seem like they've always been here, you know. But one of the main places that I like to, to listen to music is Harlings on Tuesday night. Mm-hmm. Because uh, Clint Ashlock, who's the director of the Kansas City Jazz Orchestra, has a rehearsal band uh, that he plays with every Tuesday night. And they play, you know, they pass out charts that it, they've never seen before and play them. And it's, it's, a, it's really a trial by fire for young musicians. So uh, there's a young musician that I just hired named Nate Nall, N-A-L-L, like the street in Overland Park. And I think Nate is really something. I mean, he's really got a great sound, and I first heard uh, Herman Mahari play there, and I first heard uh, uh, Steve Lambert play there, and I first heard, uh, I mean, it's been going on for years and years and years. Yeah. It, it was un- it was under the direction of uh, Mike McGraw, I think, before that, before Clint, but this has been going on for 15, 20 years, you know, but yeah. with the with the advent of, of Bobby Watson and Dan Thomas over at UMKC, um, that kind of stepped up the game a little bit, you know. I mean, the, the average Kansas City and will say, oh, yeah, there's there's five or ten, twenty youngsters playing that are pretty good. There are hundreds, Joe. There are hundreds of young musicians who have come through that program, many who have gone on to play, you know, to go to Paris, go to Rome, go to New York, go to England, go, you know, to travel in the world doing this stuff. They're winning... They're winning awards all over the world. They're coming 
through this program, and they're 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 really they're saying something, really saying something. Absolutely. There's always been that. There's always been that that you know. There's just a there's just a real uh, focus on music around here. People, there's a lot of musicians around around this area of the country. Absolutely. So, Talk to me a little bit about the uh, City Light Orchestra. The City Light Orchestra was, you know, it came from the City Light Restaurant. 725 Broadway, which is called Tanner's now. It's one of the Tanner's locations. When they went broke, Tanner's took over. Mm-hmm. And the, when I first went to City Light, it was, it was the first weekend in August in 1983. Uh, it was my 10-year class reunion. And I, I, I uh, Pat Morrissey, the trumpeter, called me, and I was, I had bought my tickets to go to my class reunion up in Nebraska. And Seth called and said, I've got a gig for you Saturday night at this place called City Light. And so I, instead of going on to my class reunion, I went to City Light and I played the gig. And I I played uh, drums with, with Priscilla Bowman. And Priscilla was, uh, uh, had, had a hit record, a million seller record actually, with Jay McShann and a song that Jay wrote called Keep Your Hands Off and Me Don't Belong to You. Mm-hmm. And that was like in the 50s or something. So this is 20 years later, 30 years later. And Priscilla just sang the first set, second set. And then when it came up to the third set, she didn't want to sing anymore. And so the club owner said, well, I hear that you're a singer. Will you sing a little bit? So I sang some songs. And when we got done with the night, he said, I think I, I think I found my, my band. I think I want you guys to be my house band. Can you come back next week? And I said, absolutely. And so it was Pat, Tim Whitmer, and myself and, and a bass player. And I, I can't remember the bass player's name, but I said, I want to I want to bring Laverne Barker, who was Jamie Chan's bass player and, and somebody we've been jamming with, uh, so I want to bring him. And he said, fine. And then he said, so what shall we call it? And I said, oh, I like playing the old time music. Why don't we call it an orchestra? And this was like, you know, it's like right after the gig, about three minute conversation. And and he, he said, well, I don't know if we can call it an orchestra. It's only four people. And I said, well, let me look that up in the dictionary. And I'll look it up in the dictionary and I'll call you tomorrow. So I looked it up in the dictionary and it says orchestra, a group of musicians. So I called it back and I said, we can call it City Light Organ. He said, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so uh, many people even called the place City Light Orchestra. You know, it was like, you know, Leonard Skinner. I love that guy, you know, or Healy <laughs> Dan. I love him too, you know. But uh, they they say, yeah, I go to that place, City Light Orchestra. I remember when you used to play at that place called City Light Orchestra? But it really it was called City Light Restaurant. We just named the we named the band after the nightclub, kind of like the hot club of France, you know, yeah. in Django Reinhardt's band, the band from the hot club of France, Django Jan Reinhardt and Stephen Gopelli. So, so the, the, the uh, so that's what we were, you know. So seven years we did that. Very cool. We made a record. We made a second record, and we we you know just. One thing led to the other, you know, and it was just, it was great. We we, we played a lot of gigs. We had a lot of fun. Uh, Claude Williams was in the band for a while. Carmel Jones, the trumpeter, was in the band for a while. Uh, Holly Dean became a, you know, he joined the band, and that just, like, put us up about 50 notches. And yeah. gave us all something we really needed to learn, you know, so we became... We all became students of Aladdin once he joined the band because he's yeah. a deep character. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. When, so he when gave you, me, go ahead. Oh no, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. I was just I, I was just thinking. I always hear how much of a teacher he was when I hear musicians talk about him. They kind of get respectful by the notion of how much wisdom and just how much good he imparted. I mean, he was a great player, but he also taught a lot as well. You know, he was one of those people that couldn't help but teach. Yeah. And and uh there's a book uh, uh that he wrote about his life as a second generation Kansas City jazz music.
position. And uh, it's it's a fantastic. And all of his, he's written three or four books during his life, I think, mostly method books. But the one he, he wrote a book after he was pronounced dead in the hospital. So I say, I joke and say he wrote it posthumously. But, but uh, you know, so <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great book. And, yeah. Uh, you, you know, it's just like the little things that he would say, the little subtle things that he would say that that made you think that uh, that's that's really... Uh, where the deep teaching comes in with all the, you know. Yeah, and you know what what kind of resounds with him is the love of jazz he had, and I read an article after he passed about his wife and their love story and how powerful it was, and I remember thinking it just added another layer to how cool he was, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, you you've been you've been at this for forty years as a performer. Uh, is there a period of your career that you think, man, it, it, there was a lot going on, I grew a lot, something that sticks out in your mind? There are several. There are several. I've been so blessed to have, uh, you know, one of the things about music, if you can if you can play music, you can learn how to play music at a level where you can play with other people. That's that's a joyous occasion. If you can if you can play at a level where you can you can join your your mentors and you can play music with them and they can have respect for you as a musician and they're people that you looked up to. That's another level of great joy in music. If you can if you can go play with your mentors and then your mentors can look to you to further them and help them along in their career or help them along as they're getting older. Um, that's another level of great joy in music. And if you can, you know, like uh, with Aladdin, um, he called me his 25-year man. Mm-hmm. So, like, you know, I know lots of people who say, you know, I'll Wow, how did he change my life? And I'm his great student, and I studied him for a year. And I studied him for two years. I I lived that guy for 25 years. You know, saying stuff to me that I went, really? What in the hell does he mean by that? And then have to think, wow, he meant that? Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> <laughs> I was still like, you know, him and Bill Goodwin, the drummer. Uh, who, who produced the City Light Orchestra's second album, who was a drum, Bill was a drummer, or still is a drummer with Phil Woods after 50 years. Um, and, and then Bill introduced me to Mike Melboyne, the pianist, and Mike was, you know, I was just in, in, in love with Mike's music because of Tom Waits' Nighthawks at the Diner. And Bill and Mike played on that album. Well, Bill introduced me to Mike, Mike, inter- Mike introduced me to his songs. I became the, you know, the foremost singer of Mike's compositions. Uh, I helped him win a win a Grammy or win a Grammy nomination, get a Grammy nomination in 2004. And then I watched as he left the planet, as he passed away, and was you know a close friend and and, and um, you know a, 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 a men- you know almost a mentor in some ways to, you know, you know, in some ways, in life ways, where it's just amazing. I mean, I, I've had such a rich career, because, and that's that's the, the main wealth of it all, is the fact that I've earned the respect of people like Alba Dean and Mike Melvoin and Phil Woods and and Bill, you know. That's that's a big deal, you know, and then, and then to be able to pass that, Knowledge on to people like Nate Eldar and younger musicians, Herman, you know, that are coming up and watch them sprout off into what they do. That's another blessing. So it's it just it's you know there's a continuum in jazz that that uh, there's a continuum in music and and the arts any kind of arts there's a continuum. I mean, someday you have to go to that mountain. And someday you have to see that great person. And if they say, you know, like Aladdin used to say. He'd say, 
let them pass. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Right on. You know, there's nothing else I can teach you. Let them yeah. pass. Yeah. That's, that's a big deal, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, there there's there's been a handful of, of musicians in the jazz world that have crossed over into radio like Ramsey Lewis has. What kind of joy do you get when you turn that microphone on and broadcast to many willing fans and when that microphone goes off? How do you feel about continuing that love in this realm and this medium? You know, it's something that comes pretty natural to me at this point. And I I like to I like to talk about the music. I like to put I like to put music together in a way that it, it you know, it, it one song leads to the next and the story continues on as the hour goes on because music is you know what they call it. I mean, radio music on the radio is is put together in day parts. They call it you know, they put together shows in day parts. You know, so ten minutes of this and five minutes of that, three minutes of this, and blah 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 blah. But with the jazz music or with the shows that I do, are pretty much an hour and then an hour and then an hour. So it's like my three hour afternoon radio show on KPR is one form you know, like a form, like a musical form or a book form. And then there's the, the late night show, that Jazz Alive Overnight. And Jazz Alive Overnight is like, uh, uh, I've done about 800 hours of that now. Wow. So that's a continuum. And what what happens is I continue to learn and I continue to hear more music and I can, and, I, and it's just stepped up the pace of how many records or how many CDs or albums or whatever come my way or songs or downloads. And uh, then, like, people who are, um, I, I think I'm making a point here, but, like, I, I, what comes to mind is the, the bassist Peter Washington, uh, just a marvelous bassist who played on many, 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 many records. Uh, I saw him in... He, we were talking about Lester Young, and he reminded me of the fact that Lester Young was born in Mississippi. Hmm. And, uh, you know, Lester Young associated with Kansas City for many years. And Lester Young's family, his father, owned a, a, a music store in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So so I was talking to him about, about Lester Young's family being from Albuquerque. And Peter said, no, 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 no. Lester Young's from Mississippi. You should know that. You know, so I was kind of, he, he slapped me a little bit, you know, he swatted my wrist or whatever, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's that's why it's a cool, cool continuum for me, you know, because, like, the more I read, the more I learn, the more I, uh, the more I go on in the music, I continue to learn. So, so it's a, it's a continuing education for me to, to, to do the radio shows. Does that make any sense to you? Yeah, that's it's constant growth. You there is never going to be a time where jazz will be static, and you will continually get immersed in the new, and you'll discover things about the old. I totally dig it. Exactly, exactly. I mean, it's not like a. I mean, it's like, you know, I lived in L.A. for a while, and about ten years, and it's like. People say, "Oh no, no, no! That's that, that music's past. Hey, we don't do that music anymore." And it's like. I just think I, th- I think that's the most asinine shit in the world, you know. Because yeah. it's like, really? Yeah. I mean, if you're gonna learn some music and you can't play it anymore, then I don't yeah. want to learn that kind of music. Fuck that music, you know. I want to yeah. learn the music that is now, and I want to learn the music that is forever, you know. Yeah. And jazz music is like that. It's like there's this continuum. There's this respect. I don't go to a, you know, I don't I don't come upon an 80 year old musician and go, oh, I can't play with that guy because he just so out of date, man. She was just like so passe. No, 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 no. That's not how we do it in this world, in this jazz, you know. And that's a different thing. And that's why I gravitate. One of the reasons I gravitated toward jazz. Another one was that like pop melodies started sticking in my head, and I just knew I had to stop listening to them because they were just so silly that it just didn't it just didn't serve me. I needed a even more. I needed a broader form of music. Absolutely. That's how I got to jazz, and I, I, it hasn't let me down yet. Classical music hasn't let me down. I like that, too. 
but I don't yeah. play it. I just listen to it. Absolutely. Well, yeah, the beauty of jazz is its timelessness, and, and I, I heard a lot of musicians talk about the late, great Tommy Ruskin and yeah. what it was like for people to play with him because he had that old world, real good bedside manners, and he came from a generation that it just isn't around anymore, and he loved those young cats, and he loved fostering just, I mean, he just looked so at ease at what he did, and he made it look easy because he was good, but the key to it is is that you know, none of this is dead. I find that whole argument what people say is jazz dead to be such a useless thing to say because they're coming from this notion that, well, what we knew, you know, when Ellington and all these guys and Miles and everybody was doing it in the early days isn't happening. But that baton has always passed on, and there's such a growth that happens in jazz um, that gives it that timelessness, you know. Yeah. So. It's uh, it's good. Yeah, Alvin Dean tells a story about how his friend and him wanted to, they wanted to meet Miles Davis. And I think it was a trumpet player and, and Alvin Dean. And they were just, they were early teenagers, you know, when this happened. And so they knew that Miles was in town. And they went to the, they found out what hotel he was at. And they went to the hotel. And they knocked on the door, and and Miles was sleeping, so he came up to the door, and he answered the door, and they said something stupid, you know, like we want to hang out with you, you know. <laughs> and he just left the door open, and he was naked, and he walked back and got in bed, and he went to sleep, and so they sat, they sat quietly, and they watched Miles sleep. Oh, for like wow. most of the day. And then Miles woke up and said, you little motherfucker still here? Because he said, yeah. And he said, here's some money. Go get some sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> so they went out and they got some sandwiches and they came back and they had sandwiches with Miles. They, and then it was time for him to go to the gig. And so they got with the band and Miles went to the gig. He says, you little motherfuckers coming with me? They said, yes, yes, sir. And they went with him. <laughs> And they hung out, and you know, most folks want to play, yeah. And so they got up and they got to, they got to play a little bit with Miles. Wow! And it was like that was the lesson. That was the lesson. Yeah. Like they just hung out with him for the day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Man, that is a great story. You know, all the interviews that I've seen of Miles, that that that's the way he was. Man, he was just. Yeah. Uh, it, it's the reason why his music is just been so ever present he was such an evolved human being because that kind of shit happened with miles davis you yeah know? exactly exactly <laughs> that's what and aladine would talk about you know like people would say well aladine their people would say aladine plays out of two out of two really and he was just kind of sloughed that off you know yeah. or people would say uh you know like miles if there's a mistake you know, he would he would say famously, "Leave it in." What do we do? Yeah. Mistake. You want to replace that? No, leave it in. And you know, when he does, like like what comes to mind is sketches of Spain. You know, like so, there are places on sketches of Spain where they play this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing with the orchestra and it comes up to this crescendo and then he you know, crack a note, and you go, "Oh God!" You just wait for that. You know, you just wait for that kind of that kind of imperfection, you know. Yeah. And that's a that's the that's a cool thing about jazz is that you, you know, uh there's freedom in it. You know, yeah. you can do that. And and that's the cool thing about I mean, if you go back to Hendrix or something like that. That's the beauty of Hendrix. I learned how to you know, uh Mitch Mitchell, the drummer, you know, the bassist and uh, drummer with no Redding and Mitch Mitchell. I mean, good God. Those guys are playing like crazy. I mean, yeah. What a band. Absolutely. Off the cuff. It was off the cuff. They recorded this stuff and it was like, wow, that sounds cool. Okay, can we get wilder? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I think if you think about the same time period of 1968, 69, that's when, that's when Miles hired John McLaughlin. And John McLaughlin, you know, he was doing stuff that was like, what? 
Yeah. What in the world is that? You know? Yeah. And that's what Miles was looking for because he was like, you know, jazz musicians, if you read album covers from the 67, 68, 69, they're sucking They were not, not getting any gigs. They were not making any money. Yeah. It was a problem. It was yeah. bad. You know, but Miles found a way to say, "Oh, okay, I can play at the I can play at the rock festival too. I do yeah. this. I just take somebody somewhere. I can take people, give them some music they can take to the Dreamland. Okay, I hired John McLaughlin and Tony Williams and and Wayne Shorter. Let's go and do this. And see how this works. You know, yeah, yeah, <laughs> somewhere. You know." Uh, Bill Goodman tells a story of playing with Mose Allison going to uh, going to uh, Fillmore West, and they had a, they had a, they they always had three bands at the Fillmore West, and uh, Mose was you know Mose was a big star, so Mose Allison was the was the headliner, and the and the second act was the first act came on and played their set. Second act was Hendrix, and then he he burned his guitar. <laughs> wow! <laughs> and Bill said, "Look, okay, so now we're going to go on and and play some jazz." Hendrix has just burned his guitar. <laughs> He's cleaning up the guitar. Bow's in the place down. You know, <laughs> it's like, okay, come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's great. That's a so, hell of so, you know that, up. but that time, that time period. I mean, music was making a, a huge statement. You know, I mean. Pop music was making huge, huge statements at that time. Pop radio was cool at that time, yeah. and uh, that's where I that's where I come from. That was my time period. That was when I was in high school in sixty sixty nine. So seventy two is when I graduated. So sixty nine, I was sophomore in high school. I played my first gigs, you know, professional gigs. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that was a hell of a time. You know, a lot of things were happening then. That's for sure. Yeah, but they are now too. You know, there's yeah. a lot of young young people making a lot of cool moves, and there's a lot of cool things going on. And you know, I just I just ride along with it. You know, and yeah, I, I love doing what I do, and, and I don't play all the time like I used to. But but uh, I I found other things that that I, you know other ways I can serve. You know, serve the cause by doing radio or uh, you know that like that kind of thing. Yeah, without a doubt. What what what's the greatest thing about waking up every day? <laughs> what's the greatest thing about waking up every day? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Good question. <laughs> uh, 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 Mike Melvin says, uh, "What's the lyric? What's the lyric of the last blues song? <laughs> what's the first line of the last blues song? You know, uh-huh. didn't wake up this morning." Uh-huh. Because almost every blues song starts with "Well, up this morning." That's right. That's right. Yeah. That's right. How about love and drink? Oh, boy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so the greatest thing about waking up in the morning is waking up in the morning. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. So you've played in front of many, many fans over the years. What has been the nicest or most unique thing that anybody has said to you? The nicest thing, oh, the first thing that comes to mind is, is Maya Angelou. And that's what's on my website. She, uh, she, we were playing in the hotel she was staying in. And uh, she was in the bar when we came on. And she listened and she was digging the music and having a good time. And I went over and said hello to her. And she said, young man, I love the soul that is your voice. I was like, can I quote you on that? <laughs> she said, yes, you can. Yes, you may. She said, I'm like, okay. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, that was one of the great, great moments of my life. I think there's, you know, there's, been, there's been many, you know, thank God. There's been many, many great moments of my life. I think, uh, you know, there's a saying that uh, you're only as good as your last performance. You're only as good as your last gig, you know. Yeah. So, uh, as a as a jazz musician, that's kind of where I think most jazz musicians try to be is in that place where uh, this this is it, you know. Right now is it. Yeah. You don't get any better than this. 
you know. So so every time I play, I try to arrive with that kind of a feeling. I don't want to play any wimpy stuff. I don't want to, you know, a lot of things. You know, I don't play all the time now, Joe, because I want it to be great every time I play. Yeah. You know, and, and uh, uh it's it, for for a person of my age, you know. It's it's it, because I don't have I'm not world famous, you know. I I don't have the stature to call those shots. Yeah. So going down to the corner bar like I did at City Light for seven years, six nights, five nights a week. That's not really in the cards for me. It's not really something I want to do. You know, kind of. I, I'd rather take gigs that. I'm going to be playing in a situation where where I uh, where I'm respected for what I do, and I'm not playing the background. I'm not background to the sandwiches or the pizza or whatever, you know. Yeah. So so I came to a point where I probably five years ago, seven years ago, where I said, you know, I think I'm just going to consider my performance time a part time job. Yeah. So I, yeah. I will say, I will jokingly say, uh, I'm a rock star in my part time. <laughs> Radio and I book bands and I blah blah blah. But and I go to school and all this. But I'm not. Them. And then in my spare time, I'm a rock star because when uh, I play, I bring it. You know, I bring yeah. it. Definitely bring it. When I go out to play, I'm very serious about my music. Yeah. But. And if it came up that somebody, you know, if somehow, you know, God willing, somebody said, like like with Jay McShann, you know, he, he had a time when he was in his in his 50s and so on that, you know, things got a little slim. And he, he had a little, he bought some trash trucks. And he went back to school and he, he ran the trash trucks in the morning and he raised his family and he was in school and he did stuff. And then he played when he could. Yeah. And then later on in life, uh... He, when he got to be about 80, he didn't go out of the house for less than 10 grand. Wow. Good. You know, my friend Les McCann's the same way. He's 79 years old. He doesn't leave the house for less than $10,000. Yeah. You want me to come and sing compared to what? I'll do it. It's 10 grand. Yeah. There's class airline ticket. And I'll, be yeah. there. I'll do it. And when he yeah. does it, he brings it. He brings yeah. everything. It's all there. It's Les McCann's thing compared to what? And... That's, I think you have to do that later in life, you know. I mean, yeah. I mean, it just it just makes sense, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, as a man of Kansas City, what would you say is the greatest thing about Kansas City? I think the greatest thing about Kansas City is that it's a city that thinks it's a town. We have a complex here. Yeah. We have a, we have an inferiority complex. We don't think we're even though we're our baseball team. This is the World Series, and our football team is doing better than it ever has. And our, and we have uh, one of you know we have two uh, uh, federal reserve banks in the state of Missouri, and uh, you know one's in St. Louis, one's in Kansas City, and there's only like eleven of them in the country. Uh, you know we still go, <laughs> we still think we're a town. Yeah. yeah, it's a nice town to live in. Yeah, yeah. that's for sure. <laughs> that's great. I've never heard it like that, but that's one hundred percent correct. You know, this town rocks, you know. This town yeah. rocks. It really does. But but people are humble here. And people are open and people are accepting and people are uh they're 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 hip in a in a in a in a very hip way, you know. They want yeah. to raise the kids and, and live a quiet life and and you know, it's just it's cool here, you know, it's just cool as could be. It, you know, it's not about you know, it's not about what it is in other cities who have to be number one and the best. I like that here. And I like yeah. that. I, I love that about Kansas City. Yeah, set it down. So you are you are by no means near any end here. Um, you're you're a very busy man with a great career. I just want to know how do you want the world to remember you and what you've done for jazz and for Kansas City? I don't really care. I just want to keep doing it, you know. I just like doing it, you know. It, it's it's uh, it, I, I'm just I'm just a cog in a wheel, you know. 
There's a lot of people who have done a lot of things for Kansas City. There's a lot of great musicians, you know, like like Tommy Ruskin, like, uh, you know, Pat Metheny, who, who wouldn't be Pat Metheny without Tommy Ruskin. Yeah. You know, I mean, Tommy was one who 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 who, who was a mentor to, to Pat, you know. And and uh, you know Bobby Watson and, and uh, the Dan Thomas and Cartwright and you know all the people that do this. It's just so many. I mean, to to single any one person out to say that they are you know the epitome, you know that's okay, fine, whatever. It doesn't really yeah. matter. What matters is is if, is that you just you know you just keep doing it, you know. Yeah, keep doing it. It's it's like it's a it's a it's a it's uh, you know the word that comes to mind, the term that comes to mind is a sacred text. It's a sacred text. Yeah, yeah. and and you you don't, you don't get to hear it or see it unless you go through the the, the adversity and the pain and and the, and the time that it takes to to view the sacred text. You know, but it's like if you if you uh, study something like, if you study like meditation, and you you find about you know you're trying to get to the top of the mountain, and you get to the top of the mountain, and you and you ask the the guru what it's all about. The guru nine times out of ten will say, "We see that next mountain. There you yeah. go, climb that one. See what happens then." Yeah, but it's really not about the the prize. It's about the journey. And yeah. so I'm just happy to be doing what I do, you know. I just really dig what I do. And, and living this life, you know, that's an extreme honor to, to you know, to play my music and, and and have people like it, you know, or go on the radio and, jeez, there's people listening. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You know, that, is, that is the perfect, uh, perfect way to end this interview. I... I really, really appreciate your time. It's, it's been a pleasure to talk with you. Well, thank you, Joe. I appreciate it. I appreciate your time. and Carry on the good work. Thanks for listening and tuning in to a special edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Session, where we give you a bit of insight into the legends and KC luminaries giving us all that good jazz. And thanks to Mr. David Bassey for his tireless dedication to jazz music from the stage and the broadcast waves. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store, or you can always visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Come with me if you want to go to Kansas City. Neon Jazz.